All right, so moving on to our evangelism study. Tonight, we're going to cover the entire book of Acts tonight. All 28 chapters. Evangelism in the book of Acts. Now, the book of Acts, understand, when you open your Bible, the book of Acts, it says the Acts of the Apostles. The book of Acts, what it does is it transitions us from the Gospels, which is the good news of Jesus Christ, to the message to the churches, particularly using whom we know as the Apostle Paul. And so what it literally does, it gives us about the first 30 years of what we know as the history, the theology, and the experience of the church of Jesus Christ. It takes us from the ascension of Jesus Christ, the upper room, seven days waiting on the Holy Spirit to descend, comes from that famous Pentecost event. So at the very beginning of the book of Acts, you've got 120, that's what the Bible says in Acts chapter 1, 120 individuals who are huddled up in the upper room. They are nervous. They are scared. Remember, they are rogue believers in a Jewish Jerusalem. They're waiting for the Holy Spirit to descend. The Holy Spirit descends. We have what we know as Pentecost. They go in chapter 1 from 120 believers huddled up in an upper room to chapter 28. The gospel of Jesus Christ is literally permeating the entire world. It's gone to all the corners of what we know as the globe. So it takes us 30 years in chronology. But what it does as far as evangelism is concerned, it shows how do you go from a huddled up, fearful individual to literally proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ with reckless abandonment to the entire world. And so as we look at evangelism in the book of Acts, one of the things that we need to notice is what I call the preparation for the gospel. And when I say the preparation, there were certain things that were in place even from a secular perspective or even a, a human perspective that allowed for the gospel of Jesus Christ to permeate the world at a very expeditious, uh, I guess, timing. Number one is Rome. There's an old phrase, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. The Romans were, again, a, a world power. If you were to look back just at biblical history, uh, we know that the Assyrians took over the northern kingdoms. Uh, the northern kingdom of Israel took over in 722 B.C. The Assyrians were a global world power. Then the Babylonians took them over, which affected Israel in 586 B.C. Then the Babylonians ruled the world. Once the Babylonians then got conquered by the Persians, they got conquered by the Greeks, who got conquered by the Romans. Why is that important? Because the Romans, more than the Greeks, the Persians, the Babylonians, even the Assyrians, they made Rome the more accessible than any person had ever made any place or capital in the history of humanity. There was an old phrase that all roads led to Rome. And what it took place was because of those roads, because people could travel freely, because there was pretty much, I mean, I know there were variations and such, but there was for the first time the utilization of a world-known language that we know as Latin. And so therefore... Rome being in power and in the position that it was allowed for the gospel to be easily taken to the far ends of the earth. Now, from the Jewish perspective, what's interesting about that is Romans, uh, the book of Romans teaches us in chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, that there's really only one advantage to being a Jew. That's the fact that they've had the scriptures for thousands of years. And as they read the, the prophecies of the Messiah, whether it be in the book of Malachi with the coming of Elijah and Moses and all, and all those imageries, or whether it's back in Isaiah when it talks about the virgin that would give birth to the Messiah, or even all the way back in the book of Genesis chapter 3 after humanity fell and sin that a Messiah would come, all of those scriptures were pointing to the fact that a Messiah would arrive on the scene. It says one of the advantages, they've had scripture for thousands of years. This is really not the time or the study for this particular uh, perspective. But people have gone to great length, particularly in the book of Daniel, to look at Daniel's prophecies. In fact, the book of Daniel has been disputed by many secular individuals because the prophecies are so accurate. People believe that it was written after the fact because there's no way they could know what was going to happen in the way and the manner in which they did. Except when the Holy Spirit tells you, then obviously you can be accurate and you know what's happening. But the book of Daniel prophesies so exactly the timing of the Messiah's coming. And so you have the Old Testament, you have the Jewish people on high anticipation for Messiah. You have the roads of Rome, you have the culture of Rome, you have all that's happening with the, the linguistics and language. Everything is setting up for when the Messiah would come that the message of salvation could be easily spread literally throughout the whole world easier than at any point up 
into this point. And then finally, spiritual vacuum. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 says, While in due time Christ came to save us. In due time. You know, one of the old adages of life is that God is never late, but he's never early. He comes at the perfect time. And when you look at the spiritual vacuum of not only the, the Romans, the Jewish individuals, you think about it, the, the Jewish, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, they had pretty much run out of all the spiritual capital that they had. The Roman mythology had run out of all the spiritual capital that it could muster. You finally had an entity coming up known as the Caesar who was claiming to be God in flesh. And you see that there was rebellion against and yet some that were for. It was just that perfect time. As I mentioned earlier, in Caesarea Philippi, there's this one place in the Middle East where every known faith in the world was coming to celebrate and nobody could decide what the right one was. It was perfect timing. In fact, there was a theologian about 1,600 years ago made this statement, there's a God-shaped void in every one of us that only God could fill. So when Jesus Christ came on the scene and the, what we know is the beginning of the church of Jesus Christ, it could not have been a better time as far as ease of travel, ease of communication, preparation of the prophecies of the Old Testament, and in addition to that, the people were tired of the religions of their day. They were tired of the mythologies of their day. They were ready for something fresh. And Jesus provided exactly in perfect time what they were looking for. And this is the church was started at this perfect time in history. So when you get to the book of Acts, what is the strategy that the Lord implements for sharing the gospel? Chapter 1, verse 8. He says, when the Holy Spirit, he says, wait here in Jerusalem. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Let me tell you what God's strategy is in the book of Acts for evangelism. Number one, total penetration. Go you into all the world. You know what the word all means? All, yes. In other words, when he said you will go into all the world, he didn't say go to the ones you just like or the ones that you're comfortable with. The gospel was designed to go to all the world. The second thing is total participation. It says ye. Go ye into all the world. You know what the word ye means? It means you and me is what it means. It's a collective pronoun that means that without exception. A great mentor of mine, Dr. Roy Fish, made a statement years ago that the Lord did not give us the great permission. He gave us the great commission. That we have all been called. We have all been sent to share the message of Jesus Christ with all of the world. So in the very first chapter of the book of Acts, as the Lord ascends on high, he says, go ye all into all the world. He says it's total penetration and it's total participation. Now, if you take Acts 1 verse 8 and you begin to break it down, there's three basic simple ways of breaking it down. The first one is this. It's very personal. As I mentioned, the word ye means you and me. Go into all of the world. This is not a message for the person sitting next to you. This is not a message just for the pastor or for somebody else. This is a message for any person who has come to a point in their life where they've understood that they were a sinner. Jesus was the only means of their salvation. They called on him to save them. You have been commissioned. You personally have been communicated that you are to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to all the world. So that is the personal part of it. The second aspect is the power. The power by which the Great Commission goes forth in our lives. It says in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. It did not say when you receive a full master's degree in theology. It did not say that. It said when you've been to seminary for five years, when you've been a perfect attendant of Sunday school for 50 years, none of those qualifications. It says when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Well, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it says that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. You were bought with a price, which tells me that the moment you got saved, you got qualified to be a witness. Remember how we defined evangelism a couple weeks ago? It's one beggar telling another beggar where to find food. And so it's very personal that we as individuals are to be a part of the Lord's evangelism strategy. At the same time, the power is through the Holy Spirit. One of the things we're going to discuss as going forward is the fact that more often than not, we're rejected with the message of Jesus. Understand, we're not the ones being rejected. He is the one being rejected. Just like we're not the ones who can save anybody, it's only the Holy Spirit through us who has the power to save anybody. So the power is in the Holy Spirit. Here's the plan. He made it very clear. Go to Jerusalem, 
go to Judea, go to Samaria, and go to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, there are global strategies that have been used by mission organizations, evangelistic organizations, churches, denominations. But let's look at this just from a personal perspective. There's all kinds of analogies and overlays you can use. Uh, But in, in simple terms, your Jerusalem is the world that you live in every day. It's your family, it's your co-workers, it's those you go to school with. Your Jerusalem's right around you. Your Judea is when you extend into your community, that which you go to and fro, just your everyday moving of life. Samaria is typically what we see as going cross-cultural. Why? Because if you look at the Middle Eastern world in Jesus' day, Samaria was that in-between state between the Jewish people and the Gentiles. By strict definition, a Samaritan had a Jewish parent and a Gentile parent, and so therefore you had half Jewish, half Gentile as a child, and the Samaritans, hence the story of the Good Samaritan, were really kind of these hybrids genetically, but as far as their culture was concerned, they were complete outcasts. Samaria is seen as going to those folks that it's difficult to go to. Those that maybe there could be a linguistic barrier. There could be a cultural barrier. Uh, they could be any type of issues that would be a struggle with just being in their presence. Remember in John chapter 4, the woman who was at the well, who was a Samaritan, asked Jesus, why are you a Jew even talking to me? Why would we have this conversation? And then to the uttermost parts and to the furthest parts of the earth, that's when we're talking about going way over there. See, when we speak of evangelism, oftentimes we think it means getting on a boat, getting on a plane, going overseas. Well, Jesus' strategy was start right in your inner circle, right where your life is every day of your life. Now, in the book of Acts, you know what we see? We see the gospel begin in Jerusalem, did it not? Acts chapter 2, Pentecost, verses 4 and 5, it says that all nations, all Jewish people had descended on Jerusalem for what we know as Pentecost. So the gospel was there in Jerusalem, correct? And then all those individuals were a part of Judea because they were part of the Jewish people, correct? So the gospel did exactly as Jesus said. In chapter 2, it went to Jerusalem and Judea. By the time you get to chapter 8, guess what? It says that the gospel went into Samaria. Remember the story of Simon the sorcerer? Simon the sorcerer was in Samaria, and the apostles came out, and the Holy Spirit descended, and it said that they were saved as well. By the time you get to Acts chapter 10, it says that a man by the name of Cornelius called upon the Lord. Then a man whom we know as the Apostle Peter had a vision. Remember all the unclean animals that were in the sheet tied at four corners? He said, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean before. And he realized that the Lord was calling him to share the gospel to the Gentile people. He goes to a man named Philip the Tanner's house. He meets up with Cornelius. The apostles were there. And they marveled that Gentiles could get saved. They couldn't believe it. I want you to think about the strategy that Jesus laid out in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. He said, go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. By the time you get to Acts chapter 10, which is the chapter after the apostle Paul was saved from being Saul, it had already gone forth into the Gentiles. It didn't take long at all. Why? Because Jesus said, this is the strategy that I want you to implore. That it begins where you are and it spreads out. And we saw it best exemplified in the book of Acts. Now, the witness of the believers... What did these individuals do? Whether it was uh, Philip to the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, whether it was Paul and Barnabas in a jail cell in Acts chapter 16, or whether it was any numerous amount of stories. Just put a list together here, just the things that you see in their lives. There's probably 12 to 14 verses for each one of these, but I just want to kind of give you a context here. They preached their faith. We addressed this a couple weeks ago. They lived it, but they also opened their mouth. They lived their faith that what they proclaimed Jesus was in their life was also verified for their behavior, their actions in life. They formed churches. In fact, the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3, says that there in that first century, there was the church of Ephesus and Smyrna and Laodicea and, and all these different seven churches of Asia Minor. Then you have the letters of the Apostle Paul, which, by the way, were written during the time frame of the book of Acts. You have the church of Corinth. You have the churches of Galatia, Ephesus, Thessalonica, Etc. What is so critical about that is that even though 3,000 were saved at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, and even though the Gentiles were reached in Acts chapter 10, you see congregations begin to develop in regions and in geographical areas. And so not only did they preach it and live it, they formed churches, but they never changed the message. This is important particularly in the books of First and Second Corinthians. 
I've always said, if you think your church has problems, just read 1 Corinthians. You'll think your church is great. These folks had some messed up issues. And what we discover is, even in a culture that tried to make the church adapt to the culture, they never changed their message not one time the message never changed the culture must adopt to the gospel the gospel doesn't adopt to the culture they testified to their change over and over again in fact the apostle paul because he's probably our best example that we have three times and just in the book of acts three times he shares his testimony of his transformation that doesn't even include Acts chapter 9 that shares his dramatic conversion on the way to the road to Damascus. So over and over, these individuals, they share their story. Remember the definition, one beggar telling another beggar where to find food? As they're forming churches, as they're going out, they're sharing the story of how Jesus changed them. And I do believe one of the greatest witnessing tools that we have is just our own testimony. We're going to talk about that in the weeks ahead. How do we not only discover, but how do we write out? How do we communicate our, our testimony? Because that's exactly what we see in the book of Acts. The other thing is they shared in the midst of obstacles. Now tonight I want to share two obstacles that we see in the book of Acts that we also see in the 21st century today. Both inward obstacles and outward obstacles. These are laced and woven through all throughout the book of Acts that we see opposition come not only from within, but without. And these are the obstacles that the early church, they pushed through. They, they were able to persevere beyond. What were some of the inward obstacles? I think the greatest inward obstacle of the church of Jesus Christ, as displayed in the book of Acts, is hypocrisy. That's the greatest. It is the Achilles heel of Christianity. That item which is so small in our body that can take down a powerful entity, that picture of, of Greek mythology of Achilles, you know the story of being dipped in the river Styx and his mom held on to his heel, but the poisonous start hypocrisy takes down Christianity more times than anything else. In fact, when you survey a lost pagan world, they say that it is hypocritical behavior that is the biggest struggle they have with Christianity. Not only do we have, I mentioned earlier that the letters the Apostle Paul wrote chronologically take place during the book of Acts. Remember the story in Galatians chapter 2 where Paul calls out Peter, who was called to the Jewish people in Jerusalem for eating barbecue with the Gentiles on the outside of the city? It says, how dare you live a life contrary to the message that you're preaching? Now, obviously, there's other passages in Scripture, but this is one of the things that you see throughout the book of Acts is that their behavior, you, a lot of people say, why can't we return to the book of Acts? I mean, I wish we could see the church today look like the church then. Well, in the book of Acts, what you see is people actually living what they're preaching. And so you see an effectiveness because hypocrisy was not as often a struggle as we see today. The second is ministry needs. This is an inward obstacle. This is going to sound uh, strange, but I'm going to say it anyway. It takes money to do ministry. By the way, it takes a lot of it. In fact, you see in the book of Acts chapter 15 and even to Acts chapter 16, the Apostle Paul, just a new convert. Yes, he's gone to Arabia for three years, but he's been given the right hand of fellowship by, by Peter, James, and John, and he is going out. And one of the things they communicate is when you go and as you go, please take a collection for those that are struggling here in Jerusalem. Take a collection for those who are needy. And we see that the ministry to these individuals took money. You look in the book of Acts chapter 6, where we have the first, event, or first um, we have the initiation of the office of deacon, where it says there that the apostles were getting bogged down. They, they weren't able to preach and pray like they hoped to. And so they needed people helping with the widows and the daily menstruation of the widows. Well, their daily lives was requiring food and housing and clothing. Guess what that takes? It takes money. And one of the struggles that they had in the book of Acts, one of the inward obstacles, was finances. You know, there's a story in the book of Acts chapter 5 of Ananias and Sapphira. Remember, back in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says they had all things in common. When those 3,000 people got saved, it said that they sold the stuff they didn't need, they brought it to the apostles, they divided it among the brethren to anybody who had need thereof, and the gospel went forth. By the time you get to Acts chapter 5, there's a couple who sells a piece of land. They're going to give the money to the, quote, church. You remember that the husband comes and he lies about how much he sold it for, and he dropped dead on the spot. I don't know about you, but that encourages me to give that passage right there. If He just drops right there on the spot. His wife comes. She tells the same story her husband did. They said, why have you conspired against the Holy Spirit? The men that are carrying your husband out, they're going to carry you right behind. Boom, she drops as well. What you see, though, is in Acts chapter 2, 
there was a need for finances to minister to people's needs. In Acts chapter 5, there was a need. In Acts chapter 6, there was a need. In Acts chapter 15 and 16, there was a need. Even today, there is a need. This isn't the time for all of the statistics. I could give them to you, but allow me just to share with you one frightening statistic. As a percentage of one's living that they give to the Lord. Did you know that as a percentage, meaning of our personal resources, the Church of Jesus Christ in America today gives less than they did during the Great Depression? That is a sad commentary. And if I had the time tonight, I could explain to you and I could show all the facts and the figures that all of the struggles and the issues and the ministry that we wish we could do can easily be done if we just gave what the Lord asked us to give. But oftentimes, and the statistics back it up, the average person today, when you take those who give, those who don't give, and those who marginally give, the average person gives about 2.5% to the Lord. Can you imagine if this church's budget was quadrupled, what we could do ministry-wise? How many missionaries could be supported? How many ministries could be started? How much debt would be eradicated? Four times. By the way, that's not just this church. That's every church. Interesting, in the book of Acts, they had the same inward struggles. Theological differences. In Acts chapter 16, you've got believers in Jesus Christ, but one has a Jewish background and others have a Gentile background, and they're at a disagreement. How are we going to get along? How are we going to hold hands? You remember what they shared with them? The Jews said, guys, we believe you you have the same Messiah we do, same Jesus. You're going to the same heaven. We're just going to ask you a simple favor. Please do not eat food with blood in it and stay away from fornication. That's all we ask. And they said, we can hold hands on that, and we can go forward. Interesting that today, even in the church of the 21st century, we struggle with hypocrisy, we struggle with giving, and we struggle with working together, do we not? We haven't progressed much, have we? But it was the same struggles they had in the book of Acts, and it made it difficult to go into all the world, but they did. But then there was the outward struggles, the outward obstacles. We see this very clearly in the book of Acts, and I dare say that we're Coming to a point in our world today, we're going to start seeing this more in our world as well. Verbal threats. I put Acts chapter 7 on your outline. That's the occasion of Stephen being stoned to death. But the verbal threats didn't start in Acts chapter 7. They, are, they start in Acts chapter 3. And they continued into Acts chapter 4 and 5. But in Acts chapter 7, Stephen gets up. He's the first what we know martyr. He gets up and he preaches about Jesus. And they get so upset, it says they gnash on him with their teeth, they scream, they yell, they rush on him. There were verbal threats. Every time you turn around the book of Acts, they say, if you guys don't shut up about Jesus, we're going to put you in jail. What do they say in Acts chapter 5, verse 29? We would rather obey God than man. The verbal threats. But it didn't just stay verbal. There were physical beatings as well. Acts chapter 5, there's an encounter with a man by the name of Gamaliel one of the most famous of Jewish rabbis of of all of history. And you remember the famous statement, they come to Gamaliel and they say, we need to shut these Christians up, They're, they're, they're bothering us, they're messing up everything. And Gamaliel says, don't you remember this guy and that guy? They came, they went, and he made this famous statement. He said, if this is of God, you're never gonna stop it. If it's not of God, it'll fade away. They said, Gamaliel, you got a point. Then in verse 40 it says, they beat him real quick and sent him out of the city. They beat him. By the time you get to Acts chapter 5, they're beating them. By the time you get to Acts chapter 7, what they're doing is they're literally killing them. And then next, martyrdom in Acts chapter 12, the first apostle loses his life. And you see that martyrdom and beatings and verbal threats are a regular part of the Christian life in the book of Acts. You know, it's been said that the blood of the martyrs is the fuel of the church. You know, the church of Jesus Christ oftentimes prospers. When I say prospers, it means grows, not only in number of converts, but in impact and influence. It prospers during persecution. And oftentimes it struggles during material prosperity. In the book of Acts, even though they struggled with ministry needs, and even though they they struggled with some theological differences, by the time you get to Acts chapter 28, the gospel is going all the way to Spain. It's going to the other tentacles of Europe and all across Asia because as these obstacles occurred, they depended on the Lord. He strengthened them and they went forth with the gospel. The book of Acts is a phenomenal model for us of the plan that Jesus laid out in chapter 1 and the obedience of the believers all the way to chapter 28.
With that, let's pray, and we'll go pick up our kids. Lord, as we close tonight, you have commissioned us not just to go across the world, but across the street. And Lord, I pray for each and every one of us as believers tonight, that somehow, some way, you would burden our hearts, burn on our hearts a desire, not just to know you, but to know that other people need to know you. Whether it's a coworker, whether it's a neighbor, whether it's a friend, whether it's a complete stranger. God, I pray that the model that we see in the book of Acts, we would live out in our lives. Lord, we know there's struggles. We know there's differences of opinions. We know there's obstacles and we know there's threats. Lord, you got the early believers through it. Get us through it as well. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. God bless. Next week we're going to start with the rapture. Come ready. We may not even be here. Who knows? It's possible.